Would you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we thank you for all the ways that you have shown up in our lives over the last year. It has been 12 months since you called the church out of the building, and in those 12 months you have inspired us with creativity, you have shown us new ways to be the church, you have allowed us to follow Jesus' example of being in the community and of being the church, not just going to church. Today we lift up those who are grieving lives lost, but we offer you thanks and praise in the same breath that they are now resting peacefully in your arms in their heavenly home. God, give us the grace that we need to continue each day. Give us the strength and the compassion. Give us the hope and the encouragement. Lord, we pray your blessing upon us this day. You have called us to do your work. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For though the night may be dark, joy comes in the morning. We give you thanks. We give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends, for sharing in that moment of reflection. And before we hear today's message, I just want to remind you that this afternoon at 3 p.m., we will be sharing together in Holy Communion. Join us in the parking lot, and we hope to see you then. We have been journeying with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and as we've been on this Lenten journey together, we've surely noticed how Luke, the gospel writer, seemingly loves to display the stark contrast between the somebodies of society and the nobodies. We spent last week with some of the nobodies, right? Societal exiles in Jesus's world, a man afflicted with leprosy in Luke chapter 5, and then a man demon-possessed in chapter 8. Jesus healed both of these men of their physical, spiritual, and emotional afflictions and restored them to their respective communities. We're going to be with another nobody this week and a nobody in direct proximity to the quote-unquote somebodies. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is invited for supper at the home of a pious religious leader when a, how do you want to say it, a notorious woman barges in and crashes the party. I'll share this passage with you now, Luke 7 and verses 36 to 55. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. But she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one of whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. From the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we have here the somebodies in this passage, the Pharisees, and then we have this nobody here as well, this woman from the city. We'll start here with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a particular religious sect within Judaism, kind of like how we would understand different 
denominations all under the umbrella of Christianity. The Pharisees weren't a large denomination within Judaism, about 6,000 strong, according to first century Jewish historian Josephus, and they and their philosophies were widely respected. Thus, the Pharisees were somebodies, respected rabbis, teachers, lawyers. The word Pharisee comes from an Aramaic word that means separate. To be holy means to be separate, set apart for special devotion unto God. The Pharisees garner a lot of press in the New Testament for being such a small group, but we learn about them in the New Testament. They were super serious, right, about keeping the Jewish law and the laws of ritual purity, in particular ritual washing, avoiding contact with anything or anyone that could render them unclean. Now, all of this is good, right? As a denomination within Christianity, we see ourselves as United Methodists, a true expression of our faith and also distinctive in certain ways. We see ourselves too as holy, right? And as a people set apart for God's special purposes. Peter says in the New Testament that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said that the purpose of Methodism was to, quote, spread scriptural holiness across the land. We Methodists are all about holiness. Now, here is where holiness and the pursuit of holiness goes off the rails. And this is what we see with the well-intentioned Pharisees in the New Testament. A focus on rituals and on rules. Religion can become all about rituals and rules and pleasing God and doing enough and doing more and more and more to try and please God. So when we get sucked into this understanding of religion, this pursuit of holiness, we're really working at it, right? And no doubt there are many alongside us who maybe aren't doing near as much as we are, aren't working at it quite as hard as we are, aren't doing as much, just aren't as serious. And here is where we become self-righteous. These other folks, they can't hang with me, right? They're simply not able to meet my standards of holiness, my level of commitment, my understanding of what God wants from me, wants from all of us. And so we judge. We become acutely aware of other people's sins and shortcomings, where up here and there down there, we are in essence holier than thou. Isn't this the attitude that comes across in Luke 7? Aren't the Pharisees dripping with self-righteousness and judgment in this passage? The murmuring when the woman walks in and then the comments about who she is and where she comes from and what she's done. Now, friends, here is where we have to be brutally honest with ourselves. When someone has come to one of our worship services or showed up to one of our small groups or gatherings or attended any event with our church's name attached to it, have we ever made someone feel like that when they have come among us? Jesus came to seek out and to save the lost, right? That's what he said. Well, friends, if we ever lose sight of people, real flesh and blood people with real feelings, real histories, real hurts, if we ever miss the person and the whole person, just like Jesus taught us for the sake of rules or religion, well, then we are truly lost. We're the ones that are lost. And rules are good. Religion is good. Like we saw last week, there are rules. There are things that harm us or harm others, things that are evil, unjust, and oppressive, and we oppose these things. Rules and religion provide the framework for understanding and the avenues to grow in our love of God and our love of neighbor. But this is what Richard Rohr says, and you see for yourself where this fits in with this passage and with religion and rules. He says, Jesus tried to change people by loving and healing them. His harshest words of judgment were reserved for those who perpetuated systems of inequality and oppression and who, through religion itself, thought they were sinless and untouchable. Jesus tried to change people by loving them and healing them. We saw that last week. 
and we see it again this week. What love or healing would this woman have experienced among the Pharisees? Zero, right? We saw what she received from them. Judgment. And a lot of it. And these were God's dedicated holy people, right? So where was her entry point into the faith community? Where and how was she supposed to meet God? She was out. And she was always going to be out. There's a piece I use at funeral services called the Requiescat. It's written by John Ellerton, and it comes from our old Methodist hymnal, number 526. Requiescat is Latin for may he or she rest. There's a line in Ellerton's Requiescat that reads like this. It says, there the tears of earth are dried. There its hidden things are clear. There the work of life is tried by a juster judge than here. By a juster judge than here. This is Ellerton's way of saying, thank God, God doesn't judge people the way people judge people. Friends, let's see to it that no tears are shed on earth because of our self-righteous judgment upon someone else. C.S. Lewis said that a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So friends, we miss Jesus when we're looking down on others. Pride, this kind of pride is very unbecoming of Jesus' followers. And we know that the antidote to this kind of pride is humility. American Orthodox Bishop Jonah Poffhausen says that the best way to cultivate humility is to be brutally honest with ourselves about our own pride, our own sins, our own shortcomings, and to not push our own opinion and vision of things as if we were the center of the universe. So as you hear me say quite often, humility is our key here, right friends? Humility is the key to Christian living. Professor Jane Tour says it like this. She says that at every stage of our Christian development and in every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is our greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. Tour also describes how we go about cultivating this kind of humility in our lives. One way, she says, is to thank God often and always. Thankfulness stops pride from growing, she says. When we count our blessings, friends, we are reminded of just how good God is toward us, and we humbly and gratefully receive God's good gifts. Confessing our own sins will also remind us of how good God is toward us. When we're addressing our own sins and shortcomings, and certainly we all have them, the less likely will we be to dwell on the sins and the shortcomings of others. And we need to consider humility and status here too in the terms and understanding of Jesus our Lord. See, this woman from the city wasn't the only nobody there with the Pharisees. The other nobody there was Jesus. What did Jesus say when he got there for dinner? He didn't even receive the average greeting for the average guest, did he? No water for my feet, Jesus said, no customary greeting with a kiss, no anointing oil for his head, none of that. But Jesus didn't need any of that. Jesus didn't elevate himself. He elevated others, right? He elevated this woman. The greatest in the kingdom, Jesus said it, right, are the servants. The greatest in the kingdom are the ones who serve. Also, and we can't emphasize this enough, Humble people listen to people. They listen to other people. Who made the effort there in Luke 7 to actually listen to this woman? Why was she there? Where was she coming from? Not any of the Pharisees, right? Now, it's not in the passage here, but it would stand to reason that at some point, Jesus listened to her. We can probably surmise that at some point previously, Jesus had offered this woman grace, showed her some kindness, maybe even healed her, like we saw last week. 
whatever Jesus did, this woman felt that it was worth a year's wages worth of ointment. And whatever Jesus did, I'll bet it began with him listening to her. See, friends, if we don't listen, then we don't learn nothing. We don't learn about people, and we don't learn from people without listening. When we feel listened to, we feel loved. It really is that simple. Self-absorbed people, self-righteous people, don't really want to listen, do they? They want to talk. They have nothing left to learn. When we listen to people, friends, it truly is a sign of love, a sign of wisdom, of humility, because we're teachable. And we understand that we know we have room left to grow. So along with this, we ask questions because we do care. We do want to learn and we do want to grow. All of this is precisely what Paul wrote about in Philippians chapter 2 about considering the needs of others before our own. You've probably heard that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Humility is nothing more or less than caring about other people, considering the needs of other people. And in the name of all things holy, let's have a sense of humor, right? Let's laugh. Let's have some fun. As St. Teresa of Avila said, Lord, save us from gloomy saints. Isn't joy one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? When we can laugh at ourselves and with others, we're not taking ourselves too seriously. Again, the opposite of pride. We don't need to keep up this facade like we have God and life and everything all figured out. We're just real people, regular people. We can admit when we're wrong, and we're actually that much more in tune with God's grace when we can admit our mistakes. St. John Climacus said that humility is the only thing no devil can imitate. Humility is the only thing no devil can imitate. So what actually does make us holy? What makes us righteous in the eyes of God? What separates us from others? It's humility. It's our willingness to care, to welcome, and to serve. Again, the passage doesn't explicitly say this, but it's pretty widely understood that this woman in Luke 7 was a prostitute. So can we even imagine the immense amount of courage she must have mustered to walk into that house, to walk in among all the Pharisees there, to meet Jesus? Friends, this should never be anyone's experience if they come in among us to meet Jesus, right? Never. Simon could only see what this woman had done. The other Pharisees there, by all accounts, could only see where this woman had come from. But Jesus saw her as a person, a human being, a child of God. Friends, God sees us. God sees all of us, and God loves us. This we should never doubt. So from Jesus' perspective, and back to Luke's prominent theme here, who was the somebody? If I may hop over to Matthew's gospel, Matthew assures us of the answer. In chapter 26 and verse 13, Jesus says of this same woman, Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. And here we are. How many centuries later, still talking about what she did for Jesus? So what does Jesus value and what does Jesus detest? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say here our judgment of others and our self-righteousness isn't very appealing to Jesus, is it? No, Jesus values humility. Jesus values gratitude. Jesus values service. And we don't want to just write off the Pharisees here either, friends. They too are God's children. They do have many, many admirable qualities, genuine passion and dedication, but these just aren't enough, are they? 
Can't we see how out of step they are with Jesus? It's not even close, is it? What they're missing and what we have to have to grow spiritually and be like Jesus is humility. Humility. We have to cultivate humility in our lives. If we believe that we've received mercy from God, and we all have, right? How then could we not extend mercy to others? Or how could we not think that God also offers that same mercy to other people as well? Christian churches should be conduits of God's mercy, not barriers to it. So let's continue to gratefully receive God's mercy. Let's be faithful to extend that same mercy to others and let's cultivate humility in our lives. The humility that leads us, like this woman in Luke 7, to worship Jesus, to give and to serve the humility that Jesus treasures in his people. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our Savior. You are our Lord. Your opinion of us is the one we care about. Lord Jesus, keep us close to you in this Lenten season. Bless us to be faithful in our habits and in our disciplines, and keep us humble. We are truly grateful, Lord, for your mercy. May we display that gratitude in our lives by showing mercy to others. Amen. Bowing here, I find my rest And without you, I fall apart And you're the one that guides my heart And Lord, I need you, oh, I need you
I came across this piece from author Nidra Tawab. It's titled simply, I Feel Loved When. And as I skimmed through it, I just thought, wow, this just sounds like what this woman in Luke 7 received from Jesus. Just like it. Here's what it says. See where it resonates with the woman in Luke 7 and see where it resonates with you as well. It says, I feel loved when someone expresses genuine concern. Someone tells me I love you and acts in loving ways. Someone remembers important details about who I am. Someone is thoughtful. Someone shows me respect. Someone demonstrates that they are listening to me. Someone is there when I need them most. Someone makes time for me. Someone gives me space to recharge. Someone affirms me. So friends, first of all, I pray you have people in your life that love you like this. And if you don't, you can find some right here at Lighthouse Church. Surround yourself with people who love you like this. And secondly, this is how we love people. Just like Jesus loved this woman in Luke 7, we care, we listen, and we serve them. This week, let's gratefully receive God's great love for us. And let's make sure that somebody else feels God's love for them through us. Amen. Before we close out the service today, we do have one more important announcement to make, and this is not an easy one. With a grateful heart, and after an extended season of prayer and discernment, I have asked the bishop to release me from my appointment and pastoral ministry duties effective June 30th, 2021. At the center of our journey as pastors in the United Methodist Church, we have always been asked to articulate our call to ministry and to live into that call in ways that honor God and maintain our integrity as people of faith. And at this time, I sense God calling me to use my gifts in a setting outside the local church context. This last year has shown me once again that God's work can happen in all kinds of places, and I feel called to figure out what that looks like for me. Here's what I need you to know. Serving as a local pastor in the East Ohio Conference for the last nine years has shaped me and formed me in ways that I will be forever grateful for. And it has been the honor of my ministry career to serve this congregation alongside Pastor Adam for the last three years. Adam has shown me what true ministry partnership looks like. He's allowed me to use my gifts freely. He's offered me a seat at the table of decision making and his visionary leadership continues to teach me so much each and every day. Adam is more than a colleague, he's a friend and he's one of the best damn pastors in our entire annual conference. So don't forget that. I also need you to know that you as a congregation have reinstilled my hope for the future of the church. You have overcome so much. A merger, two young pastors coming here with lots of new ideas, and now a global pandemic. Many churches would have given up. And yet everywhere I look, I can see signs that the people of Lorraine Lighthouse UMC is working as the church and that the church indeed is alive and well. You love each other and this community so well. You embrace new ideas and you live by faith. You meet the needs of the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. And you represent Christ's love in every corner of this city. It's important to me that you know that my decision to step aside at this time has nothing to do with the beautiful people of Lorraine Lighthouse and has nothing to do with your lead pastor. I covet your prayers as Nick and I prayerfully determine what is next. This is a leap of faith. We do plan to stay in the area as Nick has found true joy as an educator in the Lorraine City Schools system. And I also ask that you begin praying for the person that God is already preparing to become your next associate pastor beginning July 1st. I have great faith that our bishop and cabinet will be working quickly 
meeting with Pastor Adam and the Staff Parish Relations Committee to identify the person that will help continue the mission of this congregation. And I will keep all of you in my prayers as we look forward together, watching the next phase of God's vision unfold. Well, friends, obviously this isn't the first time that I'm hearing this. Um, I've been grieving. I will continue to grieve. I suspect many of you will join me in that. But I'm also going to give thanks um, for the many ways that Pastor Kelsey and Nick have blessed me, my family, my children, so many of you, our church, and our city. Um, we have received some correspondence uh, from our bishop and district superintendent uh, regarding this whole appointment process, and so I'm going to share a couple of paragraphs with, of that with you now. In the itinerant ministry of the United Methodist Church, the bishop appoints pastors to serve in our congregations for missional reasons. Bishop Malone sends pastors to churches where their gifts might be best used for the mission and ministry of a particular congregation, as well as for the church at large. In the coming weeks, the members of our staff parish relations committee will consult with our district superintendent to help the cabinet and the bishop discern the pastor who will best be able to help our congregation continue to live into the mission and ministry Christ has called us to. You'll be informed of who our next pastor will be after the members of our staff parish relations committee have had the opportunity to meet him or her. So we're going to keep all of the above in prayer. We're going to enjoy our time with Pastor Kelsey and Nick over the next couple of months, and we'll look with them anxiously into the future that God has for them. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.